Hi hey everyone, welcome. I'm down here in my wormery, and what I've got in my sites today are my cocoon nurseries, or at least the ones that in their log entries show that they needed a little bit of attention from the point of view of getting dampened the last time we checked in on them. So I've actually got four systems like that, but one of them didn't need that sort of attention. That one was pretty much okay. It's the other three that seem to regularly need a little bit of additional moisture boost that I figured I would check in on at the same time. Just do all three at once. Instead of um, constantly just checking the cocoon nursery that's associated to the, the, the bin in which the worms live that created the cocoons, I, th I thought I would just sort of detach them and just give them all a common treatment of dampening them if they need it. And to get that done, I've got a special tool from the garage. It's this spray bottle pump. Should save me a little bit of time and effort. Because usually after I get done dampening with my little bottle, this little thing, my hands are hurting. If I do three with this, <laughs> I don't even want to think about it. So I'm going to get those systems up on the bench. If they need water, they're going to get it. But I'm not going to be pumping. I'm just going to be spraying. All right, let's get to work. I almost forgot. Before I put my glove on, I got some information about these bins that I thought I'd share with you. And it's the um, the younger of the three that we're going to begin with. It's only 20 days of age. It's got European night crawlers in it. It was six days ago since we last checked in on it and put moisture into it. And similarly, we've got a couple other ones getting older and older in age. The, um, the, the middle aged one is 40 days in age. And that one's got this mix of different types of worms in it. European night crawlers, blue worms, and red wigglers. And the oldest of the systems in a, is in a slightly smaller container. Those are African night crawlers. After 66 days, some people even commented that, you know, maybe those cocoons aren't even viable if nothing's happened there. Um, since they're African, African night crawlers, I also maybe suspect that the fact that they're down there on the floor where it's chilly, maybe that's, you know, not the best environment for an African night crawler, which is a tropical worm that relies on warmth to, to um, have its cocoon hatch. Maybe I need to have it in a, um, a warmer spot. So either way, I'm still kind of getting the gist of uh, how to run a cocoon nursery and um, still feeling like I got a lot to learn, especially about managing the temperature and the moisture and stuff like that. But over here on the um, bench, I've already got one of the bins that we're going to work on. It's the youngest of them. It's the European Nightcrawler system that's been here for 20 days now. You know what? You know what? Let me get a glove on so we can get right into this. Okay, now we can get down to business. I, um, I initially thought about trying to position these cocoon nurseries somewhere near my furnace and my hot water heater. I thought that over there they can get a good amount of warmth. But then right near there, just uh, on the other side of my basement, there's a couple shelves that are just sitting there empty. It's not quite as warm over there on those shelves as it is over by the furnace, but still it would be an upgrade from sitting on the floor in terms of temperature. So I'm not even sure if we're going to need to add moisture because last time I did pretty much empty a whole bottle, that squirt bottle, into here. And you can already see right away there's all this moisture here. That bubble wrap that was covering things here was um, doing a pretty good job but you know obviously missed the edges. Now I think my gut instinct for judging how um, adequate the moisture is in a worm bin is um, a little bit off you know so I think I just need to err on the side of caution and not even try to evaluate the moisture level I think the best bet is to simply reach over grab the squirt bottle nozzle and just start loading in the water I mean previously I had used my wow look at that thing go <laughs> it would have taken me about a minute to unload that much water from the squirt bottle you know, let's do another minute's worth right there. In the past, we had always taken my um, my video footage of me doing this with the squirt bottle and just played it back fast motion, about 20 times speed, and um, and just cut to the end of it after it was all dampened already, <laughs> because it just didn't seem practical to sit there, you know, watching me squirt. A lot of times, I wouldn't have anything to say either, because I already knew in advance that I'd be speeding the video up, so I just did my best to unload the bottle as quickly as I could. 
my process for moving the European night crawlers out of here was obviously imperfect. So here and there we're going to probably bump into a, an adult worm. That worm's obviously big enough that it wasn't born here. I mean, even after 20 days, I wouldn't expect that um, any of the worms that might be getting um, hatched in here out of their cocoons would be visible, yet they'd probably be tiny, little tiny, almost invisible little suckers. And here we already found like a little pocket with some worms that were evading my um, rounding up efforts and relocation efforts. I got no problem with that. You know, ultimately, the end game for this system is um, going to be a haul out, a final haul out of the babies once they get, you know, big enough to become mobile and can kind of make their way through the bin and um, get rounded up using some sort of a baiting approach or something. So, you know, this is what what this system's all about. It's these little tiny, almost like a little, I don't know, like it looks like a seed or something, right? It's tiny little cocoon. A cocoon that looks like this, which is relatively light in color, is one that wouldn't be hatching anytime soon because it's um, a fairly fresh one. And after 20 days, it kind of makes you wonder, who, who put that in here? Was it these guys? <laughs> now that they got the whole place to themselves, they're having a little... Uh... Okay, I'm not going to go down that road. But, you know, I, I guess the whole idea here was that I thought I would um, be bumping into cocoons that have a slightly different kind of an appearance because... As cocoons get closer and closer to that point in time when the babies finally emerge from them, they gradually get darker and darker in color. So I do have a fairly dark example of one right here on my glove, kind of mixed in with those castings. Hopefully it's visible. I think I'm maybe a little bit too close for this camera. Hopefully it's not too blurry. But you get the idea. A light-colored cocoon is relatively young. And a fairly dark one is the one that you would kind of expect that it might be hatching pretty soon. So I think we just kind of got distracted because I started seeing cocoons and I think that was the one thing about that this system was a little bit different. I mean I usually spot a cocoon here or there but I think it was in this system that I felt like I was just seeing so many cocoons. It was like over the top ridiculous number of cocoons. So it really kind of got me excited and I just worry that you know maybe me keeping the environment too cold or too dry or something along those lines will somehow invalidate the ability of those cocoons to, you know, eventually emerge and produce babies. If we make our way over into that 66-day-old bin and we start seeing a whole lot of nothing, I'm even questioning whether I want to kind of take the time on that one and dampen it down or maybe already start writing that one off as kind of a, a failure, as a loss. I don't know. It's, um, it, it is chilly down here in my basement, but it still seems like if cocoons have that kind of incredible ability to sort of hunker down in unfavorable conditions. Some people talk about many months on end, you know, three, four months, maybe survive a winter or something, and then just resume the hatching process after things improve, then eh, 66 days, it still seems like that's within that range of, you know, maybe treating the early part of that as me, um, managing their environment incorrectly and you know as a result creating a hostile environment that prevented the cocoons from hatching but maybe I could uh, salvage a little something out of there and if I improve the warmth dampness whatever maybe we can actually start seeing some babies emerge out of there so I don't know we'll see when we get there I'm just curious it's weird. I usually deal with one type of worm at a time. I usually don't kind of bounce between many bins that have numerous different types of worms in them. So I've got to remind myself once we're done with this one to go give my um, glove a quick rinse. You know, I don't know. I hear people talking about kind of contaminating one bin to the other. If it's different types of worms, then I mean, unless you're actually moving a worm or a cocoon, I don't know what the actual problems could be other than, you know, not so much cross-contamination, but just mixing the breeds a little bit out of order than the way they're meant to be. But uh, either way, I'm just going to err on the side of caution, rinse my gloves before we get the next bin out here. The next bin is the the mixed colony, if you want to call it that. I usually don't refer to it as um, what a lot of other people refer to it as, but it is... Uh, a population which a lot of people refer to as the Uncle Jim's mix. And I, I believe that they're marketed as sort of just like a red worm.
combination mix of different types of worms and as a result you usually kind of get a um, a mixed bag of red wigglers, European night crawlers, and blue worms. So we're going to get them out here next. See how they're doing. Let me get this one out of the way and make some room for that. <laughs> well, not a lot of difference, right? Pretty similar, actually. I um, I guess the only difference is that these cardboard pieces have slits and flaps, while the other one just had oval holes. <laughs> the main difference is really the type of worm. Oops, I almost forgot. I'm going to go rinse my glove off before we go monkeying around here. All right, we should get to go now. Let's see, I guess this is, um, I guess taking us closer and closer to a possibility of actually encountering some baby worms. This one's had twice as much time to just sort of sit out here. 40 days versus 20 days. I guess before we stop thinking about that last bin we worked on, the European Nightcrawler Cocoon Nursery that's been out here for 20 days, to me it did seem like the application of moisture was uh, appropriate. So, I don't know, like I said, I, I'm not good ju judging the moisture of my systems usually, but usually when I do end up applying some water, and in hindsight I always think to myself, yeah, that was the way to go, that was definitely the right thing to do. So I think I've just sort of, sort of um, got to train my brain a little bit to um, take material that looks plenty damp and cool and moist and everything like that and not assume that it's damp enough for worms just because it seems damp enough for me. <laughs> so, I don't know. I just got to keep telling myself that, hey, you know, moisture is important. Don't deny your little wormies of moisture. I do feel like I'm able to apply just so much more water using this thing. It's incredible. And it's just so fast, too. It's just, you know, a thorough, constant, steady stream. If I just kind of sit in one spot, it'll just almost soak that area. This thing's awesome. <laughs> oh, and by the way, if anyone did read the um, label on the container, um, yeah, you were right. It did say bleach on it. So I guess this container was at one point sold for the purposes of um, spraying bleach or whatever. But um, I can assure you there's no bleach in this container. In fact, this container has just been sitting out in my garage for years unused. So it's, um, it's kind of good that I finally bought it down here and started putting it to some good use. I don't know why it took me so long. <laughs> I just keep thinking that I want to run my worm farm using, you know, free stuff and nothing mechanized and nothing that's plugged in or consumes energy or costs any money or anything like that. You know, it's like I wanted to sort of emulate the every man's um, situation where you're not just throwing money and gadgets and um, all kinds of store-bought stuff at your worms. For the, um, for the purposes of creating compost, you're treating it as more of almost like a utility. Maybe your township or your state or whatever the case may be might already be requiring you to dispense with your compostable materials by composting them. I know some friends of mine that live in Vermont need to do that, and I just heard, I think, California just instituted that as well. So this is just something that's going to continue growing, I think, that, you know, they, they want to really see... A reduction to all the stuff that we pile into the landfills and if you take a lot of your compostable kitchen scraps and household waste paper whatever and do something like this with it instead of just chucking it in the trash in the end we'll um we'll all benefit so i think that's one of the biggest motivators for me you know I, I love having the great castings for the for the garden and for the plants but and it's also just fun having worms <laughs> But I think that it is most rewarding when you take something that would otherwise just end up in the trash and you set it aside. So you know you're going to be giving it to the worms or composting it in some other fashion. So I don't know, when I guess in a, in a state where they say it's required that you compost stuff, they're not going to ex expect that everyone go to the extent of um, composting with worms. 
I assume that they would just want everyone to at least have sort of a compost pile where you can just throw all your, you know, banana peels and your carrot peels and your apple cores and all those things that will break down and will nourish the earth and the soil and, and you know, not just clutter up landfills with that sort of stuff. All right. I gotta say, using this spray bottle is just such a pleasure. I could feel the pressure fading a little bit. But I mean, I gave that big handle just a couple pumps and put some pressure into that canister and this thing just goes and goes and goes and keeps spitting out the water. Definitely don't wanna go overboard either, so I should just keep myself in check here before I start having too much fun. <laughs> Drown the little wormies. I don't think they'd, I don't think they'd complain. But then again, who are we talking about? Is there any baby worms in here? I don't know. I'd love to think that there are. But I still don't think I saw any signs of any. So why don't we just give one more quick dousing here on the top. Get things covered up and we'll give the last bin the same treatment and then we'll be done. Very nice. I think about how these coverings are all set up here. Every time I put a dry piece of covering on, it makes me wonder if, hey, would I be better off if I had it drenched? And maybe I would. So instead of allowing these dry pieces of paper to suddenly start serving as a sponge and absorbing the moisture that we just put in there for the worms, let's give it some of its own moisture so that it doesn't try to do that. Okay. Got a good bit of castings here. I must have put a lot more water in here than I did in the other one. Or maybe it's just these castings are more fine and stick more readily. The worms that occupy this bin are a smaller type, so that might be the reason. Before I come back, I'm gonna rinse my glove too, so let's continue once I return. All right, so this is the, um, the African Nightcrawler Cocoon Nursery. It's in a slightly smaller tray let's let's drop down Ted so we can get closer up to it and I um I could see that in the other bins the stack was on this side over here I put, put it on this side <laughs> little variation I guess variety is the spice of life here I could see that I did a much better job tucking in this plastic covering all around the edges it was just down at the very very bottom over here that I didn't get good coverage and there's a little bit of drying but all in all, I think we did an excellent job hanging on to the moisture here, and hopefully it's not too little too late. Like I said, this is the system that's been in this mode now for 66 days. I think some of the rough numbers um, that I was made aware of was that after a cocoon gets laid in ideal conditions, it could hatch out in as little as 21 days, right? Um, so obviously that amount of time has come long come and gone. So Either there's just no cocoons in here, which is very difficult to believe, or we've just um, not yet achieved, given these cocoons, the proper environment in which to fulfill their duty. So, I mean, here and there, it's, I don't know, it's interesting now that we get onto that topic and that we're kind of focused on cocoons now. A topic that I've never really delved into too much, but I guess since we did do a little demo in the other bin with the cocoons. I figured I would grab this one since I spotted it. I could definitely tell that it's a lot smaller than most of the cocoons that I'm used to seeing and it's funny too because the African night crawlers themselves are a much larger worm than than most given the right circumstances so it's so weird that their cocoon is so much smaller than the um, other types of worms. In fact I don't even know if I've ever really gone out of my way looking for cocoons in an African Nightcrawler bin because of, I guess, just because of the advanced knowledge that they're just so small and they're tough to see anyway. But it does seem like once they get a little bit damp, they glisten a little bit. They have like this nice little shiny surface to them. And I think just by doing this dampening exercise here, I should be able to spot a couple here and there. I don't know, 66 days though, what you would really like to see by now is a bunch of little baby worms nibbling away at all this leftover 
food scraps and bedding scraps that their parents left behind for them. But I don't really see any signs of that, I must say. I mean, sometimes I think to myself that, hey, I, I was probably just looking at a whole bunch of them. They were probably right there in front of me. I just was too impatient to allow enough time for them to kind of snap out of having been disrupted from their peace and start moving. Maybe I just breezed right by a whole bunch of them and didn't even realize it. Sometimes I'll just uh, let the camera run for a while or play back the video footage really quickly of a scene to see if there's any movement in it because a little bit of movement's much more easy to see on some, you know, fast footage. Sometimes in real time, it's just almost imperceivable. Well, we allowed a few minutes to pass, and I've pumped up my bottle, so I'm ready to resume spraying if we need to. I'm just wondering if we've already applied enough here. Um, you know what? Let's stop using my judgment. Let's just go for it. <laughs> I think some people even said, you know, you can even go kind of over overboard and just totally douse it. So I don't think there is an, um, an amount that could be considered as too much. Unless, of course, you just were to, like, turn the faucet on and fill the whole tub up to the rim with just water and create a big bucket of composty mud. That would probably be ill-advised. But it did sound like if you just constantly kept these things soaked, that would probably be better than um, anything else. They would certainly tolerate it, even if it was maybe a little too much. Castings are very nice, I must say. They all seem like they crumble pretty nicely. And they just seem to like have that fineness and pureness quality that you typically find in my systems where I, I just don't go too crazy or overboard trying to wade out all the little sticks and stems from all the leaves that I use to break down. If I, if I have little bits of organic matter remaining in my compost, it's fine. You know, that stuff's just going to continue breaking down if I put this stuff into storage or if it goes right out into the garden. Just that breakdown process itself is always just going to continue to nourish the, the surrounding plants and whatever. So, I guess the other um, plus side of having the material still have some residual scraps of this and that in it, and it is that here, specifically, you've got baby worms that are going to be showing up soon, if we're lucky. Um, and we need them to have a supply of food, bedding, stuff like that. And this stuff is chock full of those wonderful things. So I believe here, once again, we're going to be a little bit shy of covering up at the bottom, but the top looks like it's pretty much tucked in, as is the sides. So I think we're pretty much done here. I've only got a few things that I need to still clean up and put away and I guess the other to-do item with these is to maybe seek out a warmer spot to keep them than where I've been keeping them till now. Um, but I'll take care of all those things once I'm done here. Let me just really quickly say before I go, thanks. Thanks so much for watching. I appreciate your time and your company. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, as always, please remember to leave me a thumbs up. That's always really appreciated. And if you haven't done so already, please also consider subscribing to the channel too. That's really appreciated as well. All right, everyone. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.